lot of times during the month of December, I listen to uh, 99.9 because I play Christmas music all the time. And some of it's the old stuff, the old stuff like uh, Perry Como and Andy Williams, people my parents listened to. I didn't. I was not old enough, of course. Uh, But I love Andy Williams when he belts out, it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's so positive and so gung-ho, and I, I just love that. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But I've been thinking about some observations about the Christmas season. And it seems like this time of year brings out the best and the worst in people, right? It just seems like Christmas time, this season, this, this time of year, it seems like it brings out the best and the worst in people. And, and let me give you an example. So like, like some are a lot more friendly or a lot more jolly, a lot warmer. Uh, some are more generous. Uh, I was talking, I'm telling the truth, just a few days ago, I was talking to a homeless guy. We were just visiting, and I was asking him to tell me his story, and we were talking about some things that he does and how he gets by, and he was telling me, this time of year is great. He said, people are a lot more generous. And I said, well, that's good to know. So, so that's the good thing. Now, the, 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 the other thing, though, the, the bad part of this, what brings out the worst, is others get really stressed out and get agitated. And all you gotta do is drive near the mall. Like a week or so ago, just drive anywhere near the Chandler Mall within a mile radius, and, and um, you feel a little bit of that stress, especially if you don't wanna even be near there, but you're having to drive down Chandler, and there's all this traffic, and there's these people that <laughs> obviously waited to the last minute to buy their Christmas gifts. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I think about these, these things, and I, I think that we tend to vacillate probably between the two where it brings out the best and sometimes it brings out the worst. And so what I want to do right now is I want us to, I want us to focus on what's really important and the whole basis for this season, the whole, the whole reason for its existence, the whole reason we celebrate and we put up lights and we put de- decorations. I want us to focus on this thing called the incarnation. And we've been in this series through this season of Advent, and we've been doing this series called God With Us, talking about the incarnation of Christ, and we've been living in John chapter 1 at verse 14, and this is what the scripture says. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Every week we've been taking some of those phrases. And this morning I want to look at the last few words. It says, talks about the one and only Son, that we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, is grace and truth. And I would ask that you would pray silently for me as I get ready to talk to you for a little while. Would you pray for me, please? And Father, thanks for uh, the opportunity to sing some beautiful music and to engage in worship and to see each other and to be in fellowship. I pray, God, you'd speak to us And I pray you'd help me to say and be what you want. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And I'll ask all these kind favors in Christ's holy name. Amen. Grace and truth. They They sound almost like they're in opposition with each other. Grace and truth. They sound almost like they're in competition with each other. But but let me say this to you, they're they're not. They're both good. And they're both important. In fact, I would, I would say they're critical. Now, for a long time, I've been fascinated, um, probably when I started uh, as, a, as a pastor, I, I've just been really fascinated with personality disorders. And I, I, I find some of them helpful to understand ourselves better. And, and I, I remember back, uh, man, mid to late 80s, did the Myers-Briggs and that was really good and helpful. And, and, and then um, a number of years ago, I really liked Strengths Finders. 
Uh, I like that because they, po- they kind of focus on the positive and not just your weaknesses. So Strengths Finders was helpful. The last couple of years, I've, I've really been doing some reading and uh, listening about a thing called the Enneagram, which is an ancient personality disorder. And I really like it. It's really fascinating. It's taught me a lot. Uh, by the way, those of you that know what the Enneagram is, I'm a nine. So that'll help you understand me a lot better. These personality disorders kind of tell us a lot, and there's some cool stuff. And I kind of think it's mostly because of personality. We, we tend to lean one way or the other when it comes to grace and truth, right? That, that again, it's not good or bad. There's not right or wrong. It's not that. It's, it's probably because of upbringing or experience or education or environment or, or nurture, but, but maybe even personality. We tend to be grace people and truth people, and talking to some people in between gatherings, um, some married couples were talking to me and they said, you know, like this person's a grace, per- grace person, this person's a truth person, and they kind of balance each other out. They, there's, there's this balancing there, but you're either a grace person or you lean towards grace or lean towards truth is what I would say. And so I was, I was thinking about this, that grace people uh, can be pleasant, and welcoming, and they don't ruffle feathers, and, and they cut us a lot of slack, and a lot of times they're easygoing and, and accepting, and sometimes they're even tolerant. Now, I'm not going to talk about their weaknesses and flaws, and I won't do it for the grace or the truth people. Truth people are easy to admire. They, they have convictions, and they have principles. Uh, they believe in right and wrong, and they set standards, and they tend to be logical, and they see black and white with very few gray areas. I'm not gonna say about negative stuff about truth people. So I'm kinda curious, which way do you lean? Just out of curiosity, now here's what I want you to do. If you're seated next to someone that you know, if you're seated next to a stranger, just kinda smile and nod. You don't have to do any more than that, so no pressure. But if you're seated someone that you know, I want you to look them in the face and say, I'm a grace person or I'm a truth person. Whichever one you are, you tell that person, then listen to what they say. Ready? Go. Tell them what you are. I'm glad there's no arguments breaking out, no fights. Um, so, So here's the amazing thing about this. You know, you lean one way or the other, generally speaking. Here's the amazing thing. Jesus is 100% in both directions. The grace and truth for Jesus, he, he was fully uh, grace and truth. It wasn't a move to the middle. It's not being one of the other. It's not leaning one direction. It's not even about being balanced. The scripture says he was full of grace and truth. That's, that's fascinating. And, and I guess the big idea is that Jesus came full of grace and truth, and we need both, right? Now, I wonder, of all the things that John wrote about Jesus, of all the things, and he mentioned about Jesus, why did he pick these two things? Why did he land on grace and truth? And it must be important. I do think we have a clue if you look a few verses down from verse 14. In John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Here's what John writes, out of his fullness, we have received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law came through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. And all this kind of, it's interesting to me because it echoes back to the Exodus. And we've talked about that the last few weeks, that this whole thing from John chapter 1 verse 14 has a lot of, parallels with when the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt and those stories about how God made his presence known and he actually camped with them that he showed up in the form of a cloud his glory showed up in the form of a cloud or a fire on Mount Sinai or just there where his glory was in that tent right in the middle of camp the Hebrew words that they would have used for grace can also be translated as steadfast love. And this 
steadfast love and truth in the Old Testament describes and speaks of God's continual covenantal love and faithfulness that it's, that it's so incredible that it's not conditioned. Now what Jesus brought to us was, was not a competition with the law or it wasn't in competition with each other, grace and truth, but, but John is contrasting the law with, with what Jesus did. And more than that, Jesus, the eternal word, the, the logos, the word became flesh, was the fulfillment of that law. He was the fulfillment. He was what it was pointing to. So let's, let's define some things. Grace, first of all, some of you could give me a definition right now, and you'd say something like this, that grace is the unmerited favor of God, and that is correct. It is the unearned, unmerited Undeserved love and favor of God. That's, that's a great definition of grace. And I think about Jesus, and there's so many ways that he showed grace. Uh, the leper, the story of the leper, Mark chapter 1. You're not supposed to get near him. Lepers are supposed to keep their distance. They're supposed to yell unclean. This one comes up to Jesus. He's breaking the law. Comes up to Jesus, said, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And the scripture says, filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. And he said, I am willing and he healed him and he made him clean. That's grace. Uh, Zacchaeus, pipsqueak, tax collector, no one liked him. He was, he was kind of a punk. He was, he, was a, he was a little jerk. Took advantage of people, ripped him off. Couldn't stand him. People detested him. He climbs up a tree just so he can see Jesus when Jesus and his entourage are walking down the street and Jesus stops, looks up at the tree, calls him by name, says, I'm gonna have lunch with you today. <laughs> Zacchaeus was kind of hurting socially, so he's delighted. Woo! <laughs> Got the big guy coming over. Somebody's gonna talk to me at least. Amen. Jesus talks to him and what happens? Salvation comes to that house and he experiences God's grace Amen. and he changes, Right? A uh, woman at the well, John chapter 4, remember that story? The disciples are heading to Taco Bell to go get some food. Uh, Jesus hangs out at the well. It's at the hottest part of the day. Now, we can understand this because we live in Arizona, and I know the weather is gorgeous right now. But think July, think August. Think monsoon season when it's 113 degrees in the hottest part of the day. You don't go outside unless you just absolutely have to. This woman goes because she doesn't want to see anyone. She wants to have no interaction with anybody. She goes to the well and Jesus shows up, asks her for a drink. They start having conversation. And transformation comes to this woman. Not only that, but she goes back to the village and the whole village is impacted because of her conversation with Jesus and the grace that he showed her. One of my favorite is the little children. You know all those stories where the little children are drawn to Jesus and they come running towards them or parents want Jesus to pray over them, lay his hands on them, whatever, and they're bringing the little children and Jesus' entourage, his handlers, <laughs> his guys, his body men say, wait, stop, don't approach the master. And Jesus dresses them down. <laughs> Jesus gets fired up and he says, don't tell them not to come to me, back off. And he yells to the kids, come on, come on. And I just think of Jesus hugging kids and picking them up and just celebrating them. And he says, by the way, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like, just so you know. That's grace. Other people thought of children in that day and age as to be seen and not heard. They didn't even care if they were seen. They kept them at arm's length. That's grace. You see, Jesus was a man of grace, and that's the way he was. We deserve punishment. We deserve justice, but Jesus gave grace. Jesus granted favor and mercy. And the uncanny thing is that God came to earth to be with us, to live and to die for us people when it was not deserved. It's an act of pure love on God's part. That's that limitless kindness, that's that steadfast love we see rooted back in the Old Testament. 
can't always explain it. Truth. What do I mean by truth? Well, truth means real. Truth is, is reality. Jesus is all about being real. He was full of truth. And if you look at this literally, uh, the way it can be defined is that which is open to view, that which is unconcealed, that which is transparent. And it sounds a lot like verse 14 to me, right? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. It's, it's where we can see it, where we can see it and witness it. You see, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and reality. An interesting thing about that is that that second word, truth, the way it is written in, the language that it is written in, it's not something that is added to the first noun or the first word, but it explains it or it embodies it. It's, it's not a both and, it's rather an either or. I think of this example about truth. John chapter 8, woman caught in adultery. You remember what happened to that? That, that? I think it was a setup, but there are people that are experts in the religious law that can't wait, and so they pick up their favorite stone, and they're about to kill this woman. They're about to stone her to death because that's what the law said, and Jesus is kind of drawing in the sand, and they're wondering why in the world he's drawing in the sand, and he says something. They said, well, what do you say about this? Trying to entrap him. And what does Jesus say? He said, hey, any of you without sin, go ahead and be the first ones to throw the stone. <laughs> it's crickets. It's quiet, except for the sound of the rocks dropping with a thud. Everybody leaves. Jesus is with her alone. What did Jesus say to her? He said, well, where are they? Has anyone condemned you? And she answered, no, no one has, Lord. That's, that's grace. She deserved something else, but Jesus was a man of grace. But then what did Jesus say after that, right? <laughs> he said, oh, and go and sin no more. Go and leave your life of sin Here's what he's saying to her, stop it. <laughs> you don't have to do that. I know that's in the past. You, you don't have to do that. S stop it. That's truth. It's reality. And Jesus is the embodiment of truth. And, and I, I think of um, when Jesus was standing before Pilate and Pilate's doing the Inquisition and he's, he's grilling Jesus before he... Uh, turns him over to be crucified. He asks Jesus this question. He says, well, what is truth? And, and I read that narrative and I want to just, I just want to crawl into that story and grab Pilate and say, you're looking at it. You're looking at him. Jesus said in John chapter 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. And I believe to see truth, we must look at Jesus. That Jesus is the embodiment and the communicator of truth. He said in John chapter 8, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. How are we free? We are free in Christ when we come to know the truth. The one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Not only that, but when Jesus left this earth in bodily form, at the last supper he was talking to his disciples, he was talking to his closest friends, he was trying to prepare them. He started teaching them about the Holy Spirit. Guess what? The Spirit, by the way, the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. He left us with his, with his Spirit to guide us into what? Into all truth. We read that Jesus was full of grace and truth. Don't picture it as being in the middle. He didn't lean one way or the other. He, it's not a left or right moving towards the center. Jesus has not just somehow achieved balance in all this. Jesus is full of grace and truth. And truth, and it's like the paradox that we say that he is fully God and fully man. Does it add up in our minds? No. Does it make sense in our minds? No. Is it true? Yes. Jesus is full of grace and truth. 
And it is out of his fullness that we receive grace. And it is out of his fullness that we receive truth. That Jesus was perfect in manifesting grace and truth, and he embodied both. So here's what I want you to be thinking about. That Jesus came full of grace and truth, and we need both. Jesus came full of grace and truth, and we need both. A a few weeks ago, I was reading, just for my own sake, my own uh, nurture, my own growth, and I was reading Colossians chapter 2. Listen to what Paul writes. This is so good. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That's the incarnation. So we've been talking about, for this is the fourth week now, that's the incarnation. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Grace and truth is seen in how we love. It's a great quote from Warren Wiersbe. He said, truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. So remember this, that Jesus came full of grace and truth and we need both. We need Jesus. We need grace and truth. When you get Jesus, you get both. We desperately need grace in our lives. I desperately need grace in my life. We desperately need truth in our lives. I desperately need truth in my life. Only Jesus lived in perfect Grace and truth. So let me give you some takeaways, some application to this. Uh, here's, here's the first thing is I, I, I want you to embrace the fullness found in Jesus. In, in Christ, we can experience his fullness where it's grace and truth that we don't have to be empty anymore. And I'm fascinated with John chapter one and Colossians chapter two talk about about fullness that we can experience is fullness. Uh, Here's the second thing is don't, or uh, uh, let 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 me start again. Allow Jesus to enable you to give grace to others. Allow Jesus to enable you to give grace to others. Got my hair cut yesterday. Young woman that's cutting my hair, she's a relatively new mom this will be her little one's first Christmas, and we were talking about her Christmas plans. And I said, are you so excited? She said, no, not really. I'm like, why? I mean, it's going to be one of the greatest Christmases ever. She said, oh, there's a lot of tension in my family. It's a lot of hurt. My parents are divorced. They don't get along well, and I'm trying to figure out how to navigate all that. Let's just get really practical. And let's really be honest. There are some here today that the next few days of being with family makes you feel stress, right? The idea of being with family, those strained and uncomfortable relationships make Christmas a tough time. And some dread having to be with family because of the tension and the angst. And let me challenge you to do this. Give grace, give grace, even when it's undeserved. Even when that family member crossed you. Even when that family member let you down. Even when that family member drives you crazy. Give grace. Give grace. I was, uh, I was praying. I was praying. I was working on this message and I was praying. I asked God to give me a, a personal story of grace. I don't want someone else's story. I want to read it out of a book. I don't want to read it on a blog. Just God, give me a a personal story of grace. He gave me Gary. He gave me Gary. He's a Cabela's representative. Let me explain. Um, One of my personality quirks is um, I I, I procrastinate. I know you won't believe that. I know. Those of you that know me, you're like, really? Really? There's, there's a little bit of a perfectionism. It's kind of messed up with the number nine in me on the Enneagram. 
uh, and, and I want the perfect gift. And so I, I, my wife and I are going to get a gift for a relative, and we want to do this, and we love this person, and we want to do something special. So I want a perfect gift, but I also want it to be at the right price point. Do you know what I'm saying? Are you with me? Are you feeling me here? You got it? So I, we're wrestling about what to do. We finally decide what to do. This is Friday, by the way. Friday. Amazon has stopped delivering for free. Target, Walmart, too. We finally find this thing, and this is, checks the boxes. It's exactly what this person wants, and it's in the price point. So I get online, and I go ahead and just pay a little bit extra for two-day shipping, and it's going to get to Christmas Eve, and I order it, and I press enter, and I'm like, Denise, I did it. We're done with all of our shopping. And I get a quick message saying, it's a back order. And they will not receive it until like the second week of January. Ugh. And I paid for two-day shipping. So I got on that phone and I called that customer representative and I told them, I don't want to pay two-day shipping. because I, if, you know. And I said, is there any way Cabela's would have it? Because Bass Pro Shop bought out Cabela's. And she was really nice. She said, yes, let me check. And she said, they do. Let me set you up with a representative from Cabela's. And that's when I met Gary on the phone. Gary said his name really long and slow. This is Gary. Long, sound almost like a southern drawl. I thought, that's great. Hi, Gary. This is what I'm looking for. It's SKU number, da, 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 da. Can I get it? Is there any way I can get it, by, get it to this address by Christmas? Well, let me take a look. Why, yes, we have them in stock, and it can be there for Christmas if you use overnight shipping. Okay. I'm like, okay. Now, what's your name? And I spell out my name. It's Kendall Franklin, K-E-N-D-A-L-L. -L. He had to have me spell it four times. Four stinking times. I'm saying, God, I wanted an illustration about grace, not this bad, though. I'm going to give him grace, but I'm about fed up. I'm thinking truth is coming on here. I got stuff to do. The pressure's on. I'm, I'm tapping my, my pen on my desk. Oh, tap, 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 tap. How do you spell Franklin. Mm. Only took twice, two tries on Franklin. He looked up the SKU number. He looked up the product. Yes, we do have it. He said, yes, I can get there. And I thought, oh, I'm afraid to ask. But uh, kept on going. He said, okay, give me your credit card number. And I was articulate as I could say it. I enunciated perfectly. My number is, I'm not gonna tell you that number. I said it as slow and as loud as I could. I think he got it, I hope he got it. He wanted to know the expiration date. He wanted to know the little three numbers on the back. I got those, I thought we're almost there. And then he said, so this is, he saw where it was going, he said, you know, I was born in Kansas. And I thought, oh, goody. I was born in Kansas. Have you ever been to Parsons, Kansas? I said, yes. Southeast Kansas, great area near Branson. We used to go to Branson. <gasps> You've been to Branson? Yeah, I should have said that. <laughs> <sighs> I've been to Branson. Oh, I love the Ozarks. You know, that's a great place to be from. Oh, Gary, thank you. He said, you've been to Eureka Springs? Do you know they have a hotel there that's like 16 stories, but it's all on one level? It's all built into a rock? I said, no, I didn't know that. I, I've not been there. Oh, you need to go. We got near the end, and I, I was talking to him. I thought we had all the information. I just didn't know what it's going to cost me yet. And he goes, uh-oh. And I thought, what? My screen went blank. Oh, no, I hope I haven't lost everything. <laughs> My God, that's not funny. 
that's not what I had in mind. I, I said, oh, Gary, I hope everything's okay. Oh, I just hit the wrong button. It's okay there, I think. And then I said, okay, Gary, can, you can get it there by Christmas Eve. He said, yeah, but it'll be overnight. I said, okay. Overnight shipping was more than the price of the gift. And it's my fault. It's not anybody else's fault. It's my fault. I didn't do it early enough. I should have thought about this a long time ago. He said, but you know what? You're a first-time customer. I'm going to take care of it for you. Yes! Yes! That's grace. I did not deserve free shipping overnight. And when Denise was telling one of these relatives' parents about what we did, she's like, yes, we're going to get free. No, let's look good. Okay. I'm like, Gary, I like you. Got any more stories for me? Anything else I can spell for you? I like you, Gary. What did, I'm thinking I'm giving him grace. And you know what? Gary gave me grace. I did not deserve it. I, I, I have no excuse, but Gary gave me grace. Hmm. Uh, here's, here's a third takeaway. I, I challenge you to allow Jesus to empower you to be real with no pretense. I, I'm, I'm talking about not putting up a front or not hiding behind a false persona, trying to present yourself in a way that a way that's just not real. I'm talking about being like Jesus, being authentic, being truthful, being honest, living real, living genuine, living the truth. And letting your life reflect the reality of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Letting your life represent, let it demonstrate, let it reflect the glory of God in you. And with God's truth, we can be our real selves. That's who we are created to be, the real you, the real you that when you are in connection with God through the grace and truth of Jesus Christ, that's who you're meant to be. Someone uh, was talking between gatherings and they came up and they said to me, they said, you know, truth without grace is like a wrecking ball going through life. That we need both grace and truth. I told you about giving grace with family this next few days, but there's also that challenge of being someone that speaks the truth in love that you love them enough or care enough about them that you speak the truth not not mean not wrecking ball not needing body bags after you talk to them but you care enough you care enough to talk to them in truth I'd like you to bow your heads if you would. If you are not a believer, if you've never come to a point of conversion, my, my hope is that you'll embrace God's grace and truth and invite you to do that, that this whole idea of God with us, the incarnation, it, it means that we can experience grace, grace and truth in our lives. And we need both. And right where you're seated, you could, you could choose to experience his grace, the unmerited favor of God, the, the love that's not deserved. You can actually receive that. And you can be set free by the one who is the truth, the way, the life, and the truth. That boggles my mind. And maybe I, I need to call truth people to grace. Hmm. <laughs> or 
or grace people to truth. To all of us, I say, let's embrace God's grace and truth. Father, thank you so much for your love and grace that Jesus came full of grace and truth. And we need both. Help us to receive that today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite, I invite you to put your hands out and receive this benediction. Uh, this is my prayer over you these next days. This week, as you celebrate the birth of Christ, God with us, may you sense his presence. May you see his glory. <laughs> and may you demonstrate his grace and truth as you live and breathe in the fullness of Christ. Now go in peace. In the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.